Hi, my name is Yuvi. I'm one of the maintainers of Jupyter Hub uh, in various forms, one of the co-founders of 2i2c. Um, I've been in the Jupyter ecosystem for six, seven years now. Um, and yeah, if at any point people can't hear me, please just shout out and I'll do something. So this, this talk is building and maintaining you know, Jupyter Hub user images. Um, it's one of those things that can go on for five hours and still be incomplete. Uh, so I've tried to do a 25 minute version that I think would be broadly useful, but throughout the conference, please feel free to come and talk to me. Just some safety information. I did test negative for the uh, pandemic that is in progress in some form this morning. Uh, thank you to the people wearing masks. I have some high quality ones right there if you need one. Um, you know, long COVID is no joke and every time you get it, it increases your chances of getting them. So what is a user image? So this is actually an interesting question because if you ask users, they often just have no idea um, and you know, they, they shouldn't. So the demo I like to give, if my computer would cooperate, um, is this. So this is a Jupyter Hub that you, know, you might have seen. Uh, you log in uh, and you know, it lets you, takes you through the authentication service. This is the UC Berkeley Jupyter Hub. And then, see, this is still Jupyter Hub, right? It's just starting things. It's all the infrastructure surrounding it um, and everything else. Uh oh, this is going to take a while. I don't want to do that. Uh, but whatever comes after this, you know, when the Jupyter Lab interface shows up, is really what the user image is. Let me try this instead. Right, so this is this. If you had watched, waited for that progress bar to complete, you would have ended up here. Uh, you know, which gives you like all of the software, all of the packages, you know, Jupyter Lab, R Studio, um, 404 errors, and whatever else that you get when you know the user is actually using it. This is the same as if they had installed, you know, Conda on their laptops uh, and then set up Jupyter Lab. So all of that inside is the Jupyter Hub, if the, is the Jupyter Hub user image. And so this talk is like primarily about that. So there is nothing to do with authentication, nothing to do with spawning, which you know this boundary is very useful uh, to know and and use as well. So back to the slideshow. So why why bother with images, right? Because historically, if you used HPC systems or VPSs, you have like a base setup, right? Like that has some system Python or like an Anaconda Conda thing that everyone uses. But then why use an image? So there's a bunch of reasons. The most um, useful one for me is that no longer works on my machine, right? Like every user has their own custom complicated mess of Python installations and R stuff linked with random libraries and it works on their machine. It doesn't work everywhere else. Because if you're on a Jupyter Hub that is using container images, each time you, know, you start it, it comes with a clean slate. It means that if it works for me on this image, it should, for the most part, work for you on the same image. So that kind of common starting point, I think, is the most useful thing, because I've spent way too much of my life debugging people's problems and my own problems that was because of some special thing I did for something else two months ago in a different project that has come back to bite me. That's not something I want to remember. Um, and then the other useful part here is that separates the users of the image from the maintainers of the image. Learning and using Pandas or TensorFlow is a fundamentally different skill set than installing and maintaining you know, like a Conda ecosystem or fiddling with GPU drivers, right? Um, and so it allows us to separate these two skill sets and sort of one of them is more scalable than the other um, and like do that. So that I think is like, to me, the primary reasons of why like images in this kind of in interactive data, um, data science workflows are great. They don't come from our world. I mean, our world, I think now there is enough cross-pollination that it feels kind of weird to say. Um, but you know, like the interactive data world doesn't always become such a deep part of the DevOps, SRE, sysadmin world. They do come from that part of the country. Um, and you know, they were popularized by Docker, even though they've existed for a long time before that. They are often built with a Docker file, but not necessarily. You know, um, 
and the interactive computing has sort of co-opted it, but a lot of the best practices for how you'd build images for you know, deploying a service at like a large company that's serving 5,000 users is quite fundamentally different. You know, like if you tell them our image is six, six gigabytes long, they're gonna be horrified, right? Like why would you do that? And that it is like, you know, writable by the user and we are shipping compilers, right? Like those are all anti-patterns in the ops world, but things that we do in fact need to do in the interactive space where so it is important to look to that world for advice on what to do, but also important to recognize that they are solving different problems than we are uh, to some extent and know which of the advice to pick and choose. So that's sort of like hopefully the talk in, in some way is to like go through and talk about four ways to build and maintain your user image and when to choose what. This is sort of like broadly targeted at people doing research and education as well, and based on like our experience um, at UC Berkeley to A to C, helping people on the Jupyter discourse and whatnot. So these, I think, are like the four. I'll go into details uh, later, um, but you know, this is sort of like the decision tree I want to like propose, which is you start with a community maintained image, and if all you need is like I want this image plus four packages, that is a way to do that. Uh, or if you want to go the other way and be like, this has too much stuff for my taste, uh, I want to just have the four packages I want, there is a way to that. And then there is the way of like, okay, like screw all of this, right? Like I need full control, like these people are making decisions that don't work for my use case, and so then you go into like the Docker file world. Um, but I, I do believe that should be sort of like a last resort um, for people, um, unless you enjoy spending all your time twiddling with Docker files, and you know, a lot of us do, in that case, Go wild, but I would suggest that you spend that time helping maintain the upstream image instead. So first, using a community maintained image. So these are, there's a lot of them. I think Jupyter, Docker Stacks uh, is a popular one. Um, you know, there's Pangeo Docker Stacks. And for the R, R Studio community, there's Rocker, which I think doesn't get as much cred in this world as it should. It's uh, very beautifully maintained. It has a lot of cred in the R world. Um, and you can use that with Jupyter Hub as well. So. All the R users I know want to use RStudio. I think in that case, using Rocker is the way to go. So I would say if you're like looking for a general use case of any Jupyter Hub, I think step one should be to look at one of these stacks that exist and see if it can satisfy your need, right? And then inside these stacks, they have different images that uh, will satisfy different needs, and their documentation will help you know which one to pick. Uh, the left is the description for the Pangeo stacks. Um, you know, so often it's people pick either the Pangeo notebook, which has general geospatial data stacks, uh, or you know, one of the machine learning things based on which flavor of machine learning GPU burning you want to do. Uh, and then similar for Jupyter stacks, that's also a screenshot from the documentation. Uh, you know, you go through and then you look at your user needs uh, and you talk to them and then see which of these. You try to pick the smallest one that will suit your needs, um, and then you pick a tag, right? Like. This is uh, very good advice from the uh, SRE world that we should go back to, which is never use the latest tag, even though it is very, that was, I blame Docker, the company for that, like that they made it easy to use. And then, you know, it lets you get started really quickly by skipping a step and it will bite you. It will bite you in the same way if you like sudo install a pip package in your home directory, it will bite you the same way this will bite you, but worse. Um, so go pick a tag, you know, all of these have reasonable tagging mechanisms that you can pick that you know that, you know, the image you get today will be the image you get tomorrow unless you go and change the configuration. Um, and yeah, just, just don't use the latest tag. If there is only one thing you get out of this talk, it is do not use the latest tag. Like, forget everything else, just never do it. So, and then step four is, you know, you specify the name and tag of the image in your config, right? Like, you notice here there's no image building part here at all. You're just going upstream and using something. And if you have issues, you can obviously open issues and PRs there and collaborate with that community. Um, but, you know, you can set it up in this way um, and then just use that. Or if you're using Zero to Jupyter Hub, you know, there is the profile list option, which I think a lot of people don't know about. You know, it lets you just provide a list of options of images or whatever else, RAM, CPU, there is documentation for this you can look up that you can specify so that the user can pick this at runtime. This is also especially use useful if you have GPUs and want people to allow using whatever image they want to use whenever they pick GPUs. So profile list, look up the docs, um, that works great. So this is, I think, where we should start. Uh, you might think that your data science needs are very special. Often they are not going to be. It is not going to be very special. You don't have to be in the business of maintaining images. You can just outsource it to the community here uh, in the spirit of open source. And of course, also like you know, 
commit to the community, contribute to the community wherever you can. Uh, so I would highly recommend looking at this option. So um, I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to go through this really quickly. But ultimately, it's you know like images. Computers are problematic. They were a mistake. They cause us misery. With this, you don't have to go through that misery by yourself. You can go through that misery with a bunch of other people who are also choosing that life for some reason. Um, and then you know the primary con would be that they might often have things you don't need or you don't need yet. Like eventually, I think every custom-built image becomes one of these stack images with some minor modifications over a period of time. Um, but in the beginning, you might be like, why is my image pool taking five minutes? Oh, it's got all of this random crap that I don't need. Um, so that is definitely a con, and that's like something to work through. And they might have made architectural choices that grate you. Like you might be a hardcore Fedora person, and the fact that there is Ubuntu under the base might cause you emotional damage. I don't know. So there are things like that um, that you might that might or you know whatever. Like people have different reasons for like the damage they have. So it's like definitely a thing to work on. So the second thing is purely additive changes to community maintained images. This is also a common use case where a base image matches 90% of what you do, but you have a domain specific library you want to add on top, right? Like this is a fairly common situation. And often the trap people fall into is that then they fork the upstream repo. They fork Jupyter stacks, they fork Pangeo Docker stacks and try to add this, but that is a mistake, right? It's like if you want to add a package to Ubuntu, you apt install something. You don't fork Ubuntu and the Linux kernel and go from there. They are you know, different levels of problems. Um, if you do fork the upstream repository, it means you are now maintaining that puppy, and it's a very demanding puppy. You don't want to maintain that. So um, this is how we do that instead, which is you make a GitHub repository, and then you use repo to Docker action, which Hamil, who is also here somewhere, has designed and like donated to the Jupyter community, which is now community maintained. It's awesome. It works for building all kinds of images off a GitHub repo, not just things with repo to Docker files. I'm going to go through a demo that makes this easier. Um, so these slides I'll put on the Slack, the conference Slack at some point. Um, but you know, I made tiny URLs for this as well. Let me increase the font size. Right, so this is a GitHub repository. Um, I love using GitHub repositories for images because you can also then put them on mybinder.org, uh, and then you know they will build through that. So this is a fairly simple example. Uh, the way you inherit from a community maintained image is with a Docker file, but you're not actually you don't actually have to fully understand a Docker file at all, right? Like you're just going to inherit. You like in the previous step we picked an image and a tag. We're just doing that again, and then we're adding an environment.yaml file, and we're using Mamba to like say, like, okay, give me the extra stuff in this environment.yaml file. I think these three lines are going to be the most common ways you're going to amend an image in pretty much like the use case of I have an image and I want to add five packages, right? I would recommend against removing packages because you know what will happen there. Um, but uh, so then if I look at environment.yaml, again, like this is something that's modifiable by regular users. I would recommend having people who are your users make PRs to this if they want to add something. And you will notice that some of these are pinned and some of these are not pinned. I will make no comment on that because that itself is its own multi-day tutorial that requires like a lot more work. But the, you can have users add on to this and repo docker uh, action and like the uh, setup that works with this is actually quite nice because if a user makes a pull request like this, right? There's an example PR where you know I've just added a package here um, to come uh, for this. Uh, you will see that a GitHub action makes a comment that says launch in Binder because Binder also uses repo to Docker to build, and in this case, it's just building a Docker file anyway. You can click this link. The end user can make this PR just from the GitHub interface, and then they can click this link, and then they can test out the PR, and you can have a fairly high degree of confidence that it's going to work the same way when you build it. And this means you, as a SRE, DevOps, sysadmin person, doesn't need to be involved in this process at all. Um, and then the user also has a fairly high confidence that they're not going to have to like go back and forth between like IT. Like nobody likes using IT help desk systems, including the IT people, because they are under resourced. They don't have the time to do this kind of stuff, but they are forced to. So this lets us not have to do that. Um, and when this PR is merged, you know, like GitHub Actions will be used to build and push it to a place where you can then reference and use that. And uh, the other nice thing that Repo Docker Action does is you can have image tests. Um, which are either .py files uh, where you know you have pytest based tests uh, just to make sure that you know whatever libraries you have continue to work. So when a user makes a PR and it screws up something, you will have a failing test. Like you know unit tests for image building is awesome. 
You can also have them be a notebook instead, um, and the test will pass or fail based on whether the notebook has fully executed. You know, this is, of course, a very trivial notebook, but whether uh, this is fully executed or not. Right? And these are features of repo Docker action. You don't need to use a Docker file for this. You don't need to use, um, you know, you, like the other, like all of the things we talk about from now will also benefit from this, these features. Um, but that's all just like a repo to Docker style, like positivity. And this is also why I highly recommend using a GitHub repo or some other Git repo, but anyway, GitHub repo to uh, actually maintain your image and not do it off of a directory in your home where you do a Docker build. You know, that is the pathway to burnout. Don't burn out. So, all right. Back. Uh, is that all of the things in the README I have? It is. OK, yeah. I also recommend pushing to Quay.io instead of Docker Hub. Um, Docker, the company formerly known as Docker, has been acquired by private equity. And every few months, you will have a fun exercise of whether is this going to keep working tomorrow or not. So uh, Quay.io is owned by you know, old money, IBM. And so when they do squeeze you, it will give you more time to know and find some other VC-funded startup to move to. Um, and there is another demo I wanted to show you, which is a recent collaboration between Jessis and 2i2c and the GeoProp community. Um, and that's also a positive for if you are using uh, a Git repo, right? Like, so this is a UI. I, of course, this is a non-working prototype, non-working for some ways. Um, and this looks a little bit like my binder. So this basically is using the binder hub backend to allow, so I just logged into Jupyter hub. It will allow users to dynamically build images as they need into their Jupyter hub. This is sort of trying to bring a binder hub functionality into this. So if I, So the idea would be that I can do that, and I can select the resources I want, and I can hit build image, and oh well, you know, you can see there is some output usually like that. Will output will work at some point, um, and uh, Eric Sundell and Georgiana um, are are primarily working on it along with me. So if you're interested in this feature, please reach out to us. Um, I think it's it's going to be pretty good uh, long term for everyone. How much time do I have? Okay, all right, ten minutes. OK, so um, pros and cons of this pros, like you only need to maintain the changes that you have made, which is whatever libraries you've added. Um, you do have to upgrade your base image from time to time. That might not be something your users do. That's something that you do. But if you do it every three months, I think you're fine. You must manage a GitHub repo. This is a step up from what we had to do before. Um, but I do think it's worth it. it. You know, That's both a pro and a con. You have to manage a GitHub repo. I do think it's worth it. It works well on mybinder.org because you're using standardized tools that work. If it works on binder uh, mybinder.org, you have a fairly good confidence that it's going to work on your setup as well. So the third way is using repo Docker files. I think this is the other way to go from just using upstream maintained images. Um, if for those unfamiliar, repo Docker is the sub piece that works behind the scenes on mybinder.org. The goal is for people who are data scientists who use this kind of stuff to be able to build images without needing to know what an image is or what a Docker file is. It has an escape hatch to allow people who know those things to use them. But if you are someone who has spent two years learning data science. You understand Conda, you understand, or you know, requirements.txt is something familiar to you. Environment.yaml is something familiar to you. If you're doing R, you know, description files are something familiar to you, and similar to Julia and project.toml. So repo to Docker will just, you know, it's based on Heroku build packs uh, and things from that world. You just, it just looks at a repo and decides based on the presence of or absence of these files, what kind of environments to add, what to do, so that the end user doesn't have to fully know um, and fully like understand the implications of everything. They don't have to make choices on Mamba versus Conda or where the user has to live and what permissions they should have. No, they can just add these things and go on with their lives. Bybinder.gov gets hundreds of thousands of repositories are compatible with this. Um, and you like, you know, if you just have a requirements.txt in your repo, you are already compatible, right? Like you don't actually even have to know anything about repo to Docker. So uh, this is also a very useful way uh, to maintain these things. Uh, there is a demo, but you know, it's exactly, I, I literally forked from the previous demo and then push it up here. It's, if you notice, it's exactly the same, except in, there is no Docker file. There is just an environment.yaml file, which is specified a little bit more. The previous environment.yaml file did not have a Python in it. 
right? Because that was specified in the base image. Here, I do say I want Jupyter Hub single user, so it's compatible with Jupyter Hub. I do say I want Python 3.10. I do say I want NB-Git Puller, and I say NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, which are all things that you know were in the base image. So, but if this is all I want, this is a much easier way to go, right? Like if I want a subset of what's available in a base image, I can just do this and then sort of like piece out um, and continue to have the workflow benefits of having my users be able to add images uh, as they as they need over a period of time. So, um, but everything else, you know, all the binder stuff, all the auto image stuff, just continue to work, and that's the benefit of using repo to Docker action for this, right? Um, all of those things just kind of work. So. Yeah, build images maybe slightly bigger because Report Docker is making choices for you on your behalf that work for the 90% use case. Um, and so images are maybe slightly bigger, but I do think it's worth the trade-off because you know I would much rather have GitHub Actions take an extra minute than have to maintain a Docker file and then someone comes and tells me that LaTeX isn't working and then I have to spend two days trying to like fix that, which is impossible. So um, the primary con here, I think, is if you want to do something that Report Docker does not support, like say using a custom PPA, you have to completely go out and then use like a Docker file, right? So five more minutes, we will make it. So that's the last option. I would say this is the last resort almost uh, that you do you do this if like the other parts don't work because um, this is maintaining these is a lot more work than maintaining uh, a Docker file for you know, say a Go application or a Python server that is like serving some random stuff, you have to understand like, you know, like where to get your Python from, how to make sure that you are, uh, you know, like packages are right, you know, and then they work in multiple environments and whatnot, but like people like doing that stuff and there is a lot of documentation outside on like how you can do that. So again, there is a demo here, which is, again, I forked this from the other demo, um, but you will notice that it has a Docker file that's bigger uh, it is, I'm, you know, inheriting from Ubuntu, um, and I'm doing stuff that I didn't have to do in the other things, like set a time zone, but this also is an example of something you just cannot really easily do with Repo Docker. You can hack your way around it, but if your users insist that they want their time zone to be on the West Coast for some reason, you have to use a Docker file, right? Like, that's not a very common use case. You have to then just bounce out and then know what a Docker file is and use it and then deal with all this LC whatever stuff and, like, you know, figure out your extra user. Locales are a complete pain in the ass and you have to deal with that. So, um, but you know this does mean, and then you have to install Mamba for yourself. I would highly recommend everyone use Mamba when you're building stuff in containers and not Conda. It has memory problems. GitHub Actions will time out so often, uh, while Mamba will succeed so much more times. Uh, so you have to install that in your container, and then you know go back to the environment.yaml. So this is also something that often users can contribute to if you stick to this pattern of using environment.yaml to install your stuff instead of putting that in Docker files directly. You can tell users if you just want to modify these, you can, but otherwise you have to come to us and then you know wait through the period of us trying to figure out how to do this in a way that doesn't burn us, the IT team, out. So that, I think, is the final way to do that. So the pro is you get exactly what you want, right? You can account for every single byte in your Docker image, but I would recommend not spending your time accounting for every single byte in your Docker image. Uh, they can be optimized for smaller image times, um, image size and faster build times. You can shave off time here um, and you know get to like something very small that will have better startup speed and whatnot, and that might be worth it for you. Uh, but that should be an explicit trade-off, right? Like It should be an explicit trade-off that you should do after you exhausted other options. Um, there is a lot of existing documentation in the SRE world on how to use these. If you search for doc, you know, it's it, it at some point became a very popular medium article for people to write as well, you know, just like how to optimize the Docker file for size or like 10 tips to build your Docker file. But the con is you need to adapt that to your use case, which means you need to understand the existing prior DevOps is admin SRE use case enough to know when something there doesn't apply to you. Right? And of course, the best way to do that is to join the contributor team of the upstream Docker images that uh, Jupyter Stacks and whatnot maintain so you can learn about the choices they've made um, and why they've made it. And you would have to, in your Docker file, solve problems that were solved in upstream images. This often ends up around user IDs um, because, you know, complicated reasons. And you do require a lot of knowledge for ongoing maintenance. When LaTeX changes its package names, you need to go and understand that its package names are now changed. And like, oh shit, what do I do, right? Like deal with that. So just go back to this. Again, I would suggest starting with a community maintained image, even if you don't think you do. 
And then if you just need extra packages, start a GitHub repo, use an upstream maintained uh, image, add some packages, call it a day. Um, or you just want to like go down, do not use a Docker file, just use repo Docker files. Um, and then you know, put that in your GitHub image, uh, GitHub repo. And if you want to have more custom changes, you know, like upstream Jupyter Docker stacks is not going to set time zone to US West Coast for everyone, right? So you can either inherit from that and try to change that or use your own custom Docker file uh, if you want that full control. Um, and if you're in the repo Docker situation, it's similar, right? Like if there are base decisions about repo Docker that you can't change, uh, I would suggest look, talking to upstream repo Docker to see if that is something that can be supported. You know, like we never supported Julia at some point, right? And it eventually was because someone worked on adding it. Yeah, open source. So uh, that cell solves it for everyone and it brings the community together. Uh, but if not, I would say just use Dockerfile. Um, and here is a small list of things that uh, we could not cover because you know, we are one minute out. I'm not even gonna read these out. Um, and this, and there is a lot more. I do recommend going through the issues in the Jupyter Docker Stacks repo, especially the closed ones, to look at the kind of things that you are now responsible for if you write your own Docker file and uh, choose wisely if that is how you want to spend your time. So thank you. I think we don't have any more time. If anyone's interested in doing a queer lunch at JupyterCon, either tomorrow or day after, please reach out to me, either in person or through this email address or through the online Slack. Um, and I think that would be a very sweet thing to do. So thank you. I don't know if we have time for questions. Do, I don't think we do. We do? When is the next talk? OK, yes. Yeah, so the question is, uh, you know, Repo Docker has a debug feature that gives you a Docker file, but it is very internal to Repo Docker. Like, Docker images are like our own standard called OCI now. Um, and so they can be built in many ways. So this is Repo Docker's internal representation. We made a choice early on to like just not have it be usable by itself. You can use it to know what the Repo Docker is doing to debug problems. But if you need to give a Docker file to someone else, I would recommend just inheriting from an upstream repo and then doing that instead of Repo Docker debug files is not going to be support. It's not going to support that. Yes. So the question is, you know, we want additional services like RabbitMQ, PostgreSQL in your same thing. Like, how do we do that? I, I, you, I know that technically you can do that with Conda. I would recommend against that because if you go to the Postgres community and ask for like, hey, I installed this with Conda, it doesn't work, they're going to be like, what is Conda, right? So I would recommend starting from a blank Docker file, um, possibly with an init system like S6 if you want to run multiple services in the same container. Otherwise, I think that's going to be problematic and then go from there. Or I would suggest what we do is you just run multiple containers. You just have one container that's your data science image, and you run another container alongside that's Postgres and another that's RabbitMQ. So that would be how we could go. So all right, find me in the crowd for more questions. Thank you.